Well, welcome everybody again. Uh, Mike Scott from Farm Table Foundation. Uh, our mission is to build local food culture through education, research, and training. As most of you probably know, we have a, a restaurant where we express that mission through supporting about 25 area farmers. Mo the majority of our food comes from them. We also have got a pretty vibrant programmatic element of which you are taking advantage of right now. And our purpose really is to reconnect and rekindle connections between ourselves, farmers, local food, and the land. Uh, we've got a couple experts here. Sarah Middlestad is our kitchen manager in charge of the kitchen, and Jake, one of the lead cooks and chefs um, in the restaurant. And they'll be walking you through some of the grilling tips and techniques and, and recipes and so on. So Sarah and Jake, feel free to say a little more about yourselves if you like and uh, take it away. Thanks for doing this. Cool. Hi everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in online. Um, this is both of our first classes we've ever taught. So just be patient with us. You guys are our first ones. So, um, but yeah, so I'm the restaurant manager and chef at Farm Table. Um, I've been here for two years now. And I came to the area because I was mushroom farming in Clayton, Wisconsin. And got to start producing in the kitchen here at Farm Table. Got to know everyone here and then eventually started working here. Um, I love working at Farm Table because we get to use the best veggies and meat and dairy there is. And we get to have very personal and close relationships with the folks that are growing it and processing it. Um, yeah, but I love working at, at Farm Table. This is Jake, I'll let him talk about himself. Yeah, what you just said is huge. The, the people around this area with their organic and farms that are just, they, they blow it out of water with these veggies. It's, it's amazing. They, what are these, summer squash? Yep, zucchini. Sim, summer zucchini. Yep. Some of the all around best veggies that I've ever had. Yeah. Best food that we have. In our freezer, in our in our fridge, yep. that kind of kind of sells it. Once you come try it, you're uh, probably not going to turn back. <laughs> but today we are teaching a the grilling class. We're going to grill up some proteins like you knew when you signed up. And yeah, we're going to start off with a, with a little, what are we what are we drinking this morning? Uh, this this morning, evening. Well, it's, uh, we don't do this on the clock, but. When you're grilling at home, like you guys will be doing, it's a nice treat for the chef to have a drink. So we're gonna make watermelon daiquiris real quick to start us off here. Um, so I have preserved watermelon that was in our freezer from last year that I blended and made a juice out of. So I'm gonna do two shots of, or two ounces of rum. We're gonna shake it. Do one ounce of this watermelon juice. And then I'm gonna do one ounce of lime juice, which is not local, but we do occasionally use things to heighten our local ingredients. And then this is just a little bit of mint from the garden, and I'm gonna give a little slap, and that's gonna let out a lot of the essential oils and flavors. And then shake this guy. I have ice. Oh, can I have that? Yep. Should have been a bartender. <laughs> yeah, so this one's for Jake, and I'll just do a little fresh spray in there, and there you go, buddy. Thank you so much. Yeah, now I get a half one. And while they are in mixing those drinks, everybody, you can, uh, in your lower middle of your Zoom video screen, there's a chat box. So if you do want to add questions or comments throughout the time here, please feel free to type those in. And again, uh, please keep yourself muted in terms of keeping down the background noise. So thank you for that. But add your questions in and we'll stop periodically to, to pass those on to Jake and Sarah. Thank you. And this is when not being there in person is particularly unfortunate. <laughs> right. All right, sweet. So 
Cheers. Let's keep this glass off. Cheers to that. Yum. All right. Yummy. And then Jake, we're going to start off with steak first, and Jake's going to talk a little bit about the prep that goes into before you start grilling. For the restaurant quality that we have, we're going to start out with the ribeye. And before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about seasoning and um, adding a little bit of herbs to it. So I went out before this and picked some fresh thyme that I'm tying together right now for an herb brush. And we have some velvet tallow um, to give the steak some lubrication on the grill so it's not sticking too bad. And tallow is the rendered beef fat that we've rendered here. Right here at farm too. So it's nice to cook, you know, uh, the, the animal that you're cooking with the fat that it provides. Such a closed knit circle. Indeed. So here's the, the herb brush that I tied up. Just time. I had some what lovage. It's so hot in here that lovage got so so limp that it was just yeah, yeah I went to work. But yeah, then I also want to talk about seasoning too. Seasoning, I, this is my personal seasoning that I've kind of perfected. Sarah and I have, we, we're pretty passionate about what we do here. and We have everything perfected down to a science. Um, this is my uh, salt and pepper that I personally have and bring kind of everywhere. <laughs> he <laughs> brought this from home. I suggested we use the restaurant one. He was like, no, I'm bringing my home one. Yeah, I, I, bring, it, bring, it, I bring it wherever I go. Um, cooking anyhow. Uh, it's uh, it's coarse. I like coarser seasonings. Um, fine's nothing wrong with fine, but it's um, some some coarse ground black pepper and double that with some flake salt. So you can you can play around with whatever you want, um, but that's just my my kind of favorite recipe. I got that from from Jake's Supper Club at Steakhouse and. They do their steaks very well. What's your ratio, Jake? It's two to one. Two peppers to one salt. I mean, two salts to one pepper. That would be pretty. Pretty cool. I was just uh, grilling some that brisket. It was two peppers to one salt okay. for the brisket rub to half of a celery seed nice. that I saw on mine. So then, how are we going to do this? I guess. This is our ribeye steak. It's a 12 ounce ribeye. There's our 12 ounce ribeye steak. And then we're going to, before we put it on the grill, we're going to season it up really good, slap it in so nothing falls off. You want to season more, I, I found out after grilling. Thousands of steaks that, Maybe yeah. yeah, this, uh, you really want to over season, get all over. That's all salt and pepper. Add your seasoning that you think, and then add a little more. Just a touch more, yeah, or a lot more. And I got this herb brush that we just tied, the towel, brushing it on with the herb brush. You can see that hopefully. And one question has come in, if you don't have the tallow, what can, what can you, what can the home cook use uh, to replace that? Cook and spray. Cook and spray is very easy, convenient, clean. Um, you can't use, really use the herb brush then, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and spray this on the grill after we clean it also, uh, to also just have some lube right there. We're going to bring you to our grill view. We have two views here. And, and about the tallow too, I mean, you don't even necessarily need any fat. Um, because there is plenty of fat provided on that marbled steak. You don't necessarily need added. We like to do it because it helps with the caramelization and getting that nice brown flavor on both sides. Well said. So then, we haven't used this baby in a while, but it is, it is screaming hot. It is. And what I always like to do with, uh, with with your beef, you want the hottest spots on the grill because just the fastest cooking brings out the most flavors. So I just like to find the hot spots on the grill. And they're right there, dead center, hottest spot. And then we'll uh, we 
We got our towel flaming up. Yep. Threw a little more on top to let the, the herbs soak in. Can you say again what that spray can is? I couldn't quite hear that. Oh, it's, it's, just, a it's just, you know, canola, like cooking spray. Okay. Um, should I start doing the best? Sure. Okay. Yep. So, uh, since we just slapped that on there, we're also going to do a little bit of veg. Um, so what I have here is just halved summer squash, zucchini, as well as halved turnips, um, salad turnips. So I like these a lot for grilling because they're big enough and they have the surface area that you can get really nice like grill marks on them and good flavor. Um, so what I'm going to do is towel these guys up too. And again, you could use other cooking oils. You could use butter, um, but with the veggies, it is important to have some sort of fat or lube, um, unlike the steak, because they don't have any of their own to hold up to the grill. And I'm also just going to season these pretty generously with salt and pepper. And then, whoo, so slippery. Also, I'm going to try to get a hot spot for these, but it's a little less important than the meat to get a nice hot spot. This whole grill is just streaming hot. Yeah, this is a quite hot grill. And I got my turnips here, which I'm just going to put the solid flat line side down. Yeah. yeah. Jake is, it, Jake, is it common to see flames like that? And is that an issue at all? Uh, with this grill, yeah, not, not usually. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had some, like, some, a spray bottle of water or something to maybe put that down. Salt is something that you can throw on flame to help um, tamper it down a little bit. But that is just due to the tallow, and then our grill is just like, Screaming hot right now. So I'm going for a medium rare with this steak, and I just quarter turned it for, say, a commercial. We guess, let's say you have the lines on it. Um, a very key thing to look for when you have a medium rare steak is going blood to blood. And that means when little pools of blood start to, to form on the top side, go ahead and flip it. Um, if you want a medium steak, wait for them pools of blood to get a lot bigger. And then if you want medium well, let the pools of blood, yeah, keep going, getting bigger. But you can also take a thermometer and temp it. And the medium rare is 135. I think it, you guys have a, a link. Yeah. In there. Mike's going to send um, out a little, some resources that we typed up, but for a nice mid rare, you're looking for 135. And then from there, it goes up by five degrees, 140 medium, 145 mid well. Um, it's just kind of hard to deal with. Yeah. There we go. The towel. Yeah. That'll add to that. Yep. So, and if you're shooting for a mid rare, it's like extra important to have the screaming hot grill too, because you're trying to get as much caramelization as you possibly can with keeping that inside less cooked. If you want to see, I don't know if you can see them there, but he's got some really nice grill marks on there. Around the flames. Yep. Dang it, how do we get them off? Well, after we take them. That usually doesn't happen at grills here, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this time, of course. We're actually in the um, the learning center kitchen of our facility, and it's one we don't usually use. We're typically on the restaurant side. Um, so yeah. Another big thing with steaks is feeling them, and the firmer they get, the more done they are. That's uh, my point of reference when I'm grilling a steak, even for restaurant quality. Um, 
it's all just by feel and no thermometer. But that's how I've learned to do it over the years, and I don't really want to stray away from it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for you know people who are just beginning, you know it's nice to temp your meats, and then you get a feel for what a mid rare feels like, what a medium feels like, what a mid well feels like, and then eventually you can you know probably just do it by feel. What do you think on that baby? That baby is nice. I'm just throwing some other grill marks on it. Okay. Are we gonna put it on? Yeah, let's put it on the tray. Super beautiful grill marks. He did the nice quarter turn, which gets you those like perfect squares on there. Um, I'm gonna check out my veg. Smaller ones go a lot quicker, so I have a really nice char on that. Really yummy flavor. Um, these bigger ones, I'm just gonna let go a little bit longer. And the squash will take quite a bit longer than that. So I'll just let that keep going. Um, and then, should I go about the compound butter? Yep. Maybe? Okay, so I'm gonna wheel us back over, or maybe Jake can. So a couple um, tips as to just kind of enhancing the flavor of your steak. Here, I'm gonna put this up a little bit. Um, would be one of them would be a compound butter. Um, so on that link that I sent uh, sent Mike that I'll send you guys is just like some basic recipes for compound butter, which all it is is butter. Ooh, wow, this is gonna make it up, maybe. Um, butter, mix of herbs. You can add lemon in there. Um, let us know if you can't hear us, Mike. We have to turn the fans on for a little bit. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you still. I'll let you know though. Okay, let me know. Um, but yeah, so this is our ramp compound butter and our ramps are spring onions. Um, so we grilled these, pureed them, mixed it with butter, lemon, salt, and pepper. So this is a really nice thing as your steak is resting. You can just like put a dollop on that baby and it'll melt while the steak is resting and it's really beautiful. We're also going to use this for the fish. Um, so I'm going to show you something else for the steak, which is a chimichurri sauce. Um, so what that is, is just a mixture of olive oil, fresh herbs, uh, red wine vinegar, salt and pepper, and I have added a little bit of cheese, a little bit of pecorino balsamic on this one for some flavor. I did not make this one this morning, so it's a little, um, it doesn't have that fresh green color, but it's still delicious. So I'm just going to rest the steak with this on it. Just do a really nice salad there. Sarah? What? Oh, it is a little harder to hear, so if you can turn the great grill, uh, the fan off soon, that'd be good. So yeah, we're just gonna let the steak rest a little bit before we cut it in, but I've just got that nice chimichurri sauce resting on there. Um, for a steak like this, you don't really even need anything, but this just makes it a little bit more fun. Yeah, it's nice to play around with different, different ways to finish it because you can only eat a great look. You can only eat steak so many times and then you get a little bored with it. So. Yeah, you wanna play with it. Same with the seasonings that you first use, like you can use salt, pepper, and Old Bay, or you can use some floweries or whatever you want to mix together. Here I, I got the walleye that we're off to next. I wanted to start off with this, uh, put it on the grill. Should we pause for a question, bro? Is there any pressing questions, Mike, or about the steak? Let's see. Uh, there's a question about what ingredients are in the butter. And I would say, folks, that I will be sending out a handout that Jake and Sarah prepared that will have some of this information on it and I'll send that out probably tomorrow along with the link to the recording of this class but yeah the the ingredients in the butter the ingredients in the butter is uh rams and they're grilled rams so like they've got they look very charred and then we puree them with olive oil or with, yeah we'll, we'll puree them and then um, milk butter uh like one to one well, so actually we do the, the butter, we keep at room temp, because that's how you can whip it. So we whip the butter with whatever flavor you're trying to add to it. So you can make compound butter out of anything, any of the herbs in your garden, um, whatever you want, red peppers um, that have been grilled. But yeah, so this one is the, the ramps, 
the butter, lemon, and salt and pepper, and that's it. Very simple. And that's lemon zest, isn't it? Yep, lemon zest. So you the, the outer coating. Yeah, and the ramps have the flavor of like combination of onion and garlic flavor. And I pulled off my turnips. They're looking really charcoal and beautiful. So that's just a nice addition, accompaniment to anything you're grilling. But yeah, so I'll take away with Jake. One, we're going to show two methods of walleye cooking on the grill, and this is the first that he's going to show. This is the first method. It's easy to do right at your campfire. Um, go ahead and go right back into your, your seasoning that you have made up that you use for whatever you want. I'm going to just use it right on this walleye again. The same exact seasoning we used for the steak. Give it a good douse, and then we'll go ahead and brush it with some tallow. Maybe that's a bad idea because then it'll flame up again. Yeah, it's really light, really light. <laughs> really light. Then we're gonna find a not so hot spot to grill. It's not to plug it in every time it goes. But I think this grill, everything is hot about it. Maybe we'll just we'll turn it down and touch more. Yeah, maybe do like the side or something. Okay. You know? Yeah. So we'll just we'll throw it down. And it'll tell us when it's ready to be flipped because the edges turn brown and they start turning up. You can get your spatula under there and it'll just move by itself practically. Start swimming away. In the meantime, I'm pulling my squash. So again, I've got some really nice charring on the squash. It's getting tender on the outside. So I'm gonna pull these babies. Um, and you can cut these however you want uh, in order to serve. Did you use a ruler for those lines? <laughs> yeah, so it's nice. You can do a quarter turn, get really nice lines. Yeah. Should I start a couple times then? Or um, sure. All right, so I'm going to show you guys the other method we're going to do for the walleye we have here. All right, so this is going to be in foil. We're just going to add a lot of nice aromatics, herbs, lemons, and we're, it's basically just going to bake in this foil. Yeah, we want to weigh it Yep. Thank you, thank you. This is another walleye. Yep. So, all right, so I'm going to use Jake's salt and pepper mix on here. Um, we like to, a lot at the restaurant here, use Old Bay seasoning for our fish. Um, we like to put it in our batter for the fish fry as well as on like pan seared fish. So I'm just going to lightly do that. What, what was the name of that? Old Bay? Old Bay seasoning. Yeah. So it's like a combination of paprika. It's got some like cinnamon in there. Uh, uh, bay leaf. Um, it's a combination of a lot of spices. Um, pretty common. It's in the garden that I'm going to throw in there that are going to give a lot of great flavor when you're baking it. So I've got tarragon, fresh tarragon, which kind of has a really uh, licorice -y flavor that I'm just going to put in there. Um, I've also got thyme from the garden. And then I'm going to add some dill as well. So I've got all really nice aromatics. Um, and I'm going to do some nice lemon slices too. That's pretty much how we do our, our fish here. Yeah, we do a nice baked um, walleye dinner. And then I'm also going to do this ram compound butter that's just going to melt at the fish tank and make it really juicy and beautiful. So I'm going to try to show you this. That's my setup there. It's just all going to bake together and be really beautiful. Um, and then the only other important thing when you're doing this is the foiling method. So I'm going to pull up both sides here. And basically just the most important thing is to try and Trap the air as best you can. So I pulled up both sides and I'm going to roll it down. And that's going to help to keep all of our flavors, the steam, everything really nice in that fish. Um, and I'm going to put this on the grill for about eight minutes. The grill's really hot, so we'll probably check it at like seven or so. And I'm just going to get it on there, the skin side down. I think it still needs some time. It's not cut at all. Jake and Laura, Jake and Sarah, where are the uh, fish and, and steak from? Do you know? Yeah. Um, the steak is from Peterson's, uh, which is in Osceola. 
Um, we found it's really difficult to do grass-fed steak, and they just do it really beautifully, um, really great fat on there. So they're out of Osceola, but you'll see them in a lot of places. They're in the cities, all around here. Peterson um, Farms. How many different farms have we tried? We had a little steak off from the different farms yeah. uh, for what we're going to sell here. And Peterson's kind of blew away all the others. Yeah, it was really fantastic. There was four other farms? Yeah. But I don't want to put anybody down because no. it's really hard. Grass fed beef is like really it's, difficult to perfect. They were all good. Yeah. But Peterson's just kind of. Yeah. We're a little bit better. Yep. Super buttery. Um, the fat is. And then, yeah, so the fish is from Bowdoin's, uh, which is in Lake Superior in Duluth. They do all wild caught fish. We get some nice smoked salmon from them, um, as well as trout, too. So they're really good to um, do sustainable practices. Yeah. Check the fish. Um, the method that Jake's doing here with just kind of like putting the fish right on the grill, it gets like really nice charcoal flavor on the fish. And I think it would lend itself really well to like doing tacos with, like after you grill it, cut it up and do some nice tacos with like just some cabbage, fresh cilantro, pickled onion, maybe a little sour cream sauce, something very simple. It'd be really nice, nice for. Not ready yet, just not quite, and, and yours is, oops. I've got to set a timer, so I'm gonna set it for 15 for the, for the one wrap, we were doing six minutes yep. on each side, or just no. six minutes? So for the wrap, one, I'm trying to do eight minutes all day, um, but I forgot to set my timer. Yeah. And then this, you know, the one that's all right day. on the grill, yeah, is just based off um, okay. We're just freestyling with this one. Kind of treat it more like a campfire walleye. Yes. We'll toss it on with a little bit of, I did forget to spray it, so we might be running into some issues here. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah, it's important to lube it up, because fish especially, if you move it too soon, the, the grill will just be kind of hanging onto it, and it'll pull off some of the flesh, so we'll see how it goes. And do you need to turn the, the baked one that you're doing, Sarah? I'm not going to turn it uh, because I'm like capturing all the steam within that aluminum, you know, uh, pocket. I've found that you don't really need to flip it because it's going gonna, it's gonna to heat the whole thing, even though the bottom is on there. The whole turning thing is just kind of for looks. It's kind of a, it's a commercial restaurant type mm -hmm. thing because you want the, the cross hatches. Mm -hmm. You really don't have to. On pork chops, I like to not turn them when steaks. It's mainly the meat, the less you touch it, the less you move it, the better product you're gonna have because you just want that, you want it to cook as fast as possible and just trap in as many of the, the flavors as you can. The juices. The juices. Steaks, I like to give them the cross hatches because it's visually appealing. Um, but pork chops, I like to more just leave them and then flip them once. You can, you can poke them all you want or do whatever you want with them, but just leave them right where they're at yep. before it's ready to go. And pork is at 145 temperature. So that's like a, a medium tenseness, or if you want to use a thermometer, 145. Yep. So I think let's look back at this. Bring us close again. How's it feeling? No, it's not ready yet. Not ready? Okay, no problem. All right, well, maybe I think in the meantime, I'll start talking about the pork chop. Or start okay. getting that prepped. Yeah. Unless, are there any other questions, Mike, regarding the fish or anything else? Yeah. Um, how would it look for grilled chicken breasts on the grill? What method would you recommend for, for grilling chicken breasts? Sure. Chicken is, it just, you can give chicken the, the colder areas, leave the hot spots for the beef. Um, chicken, you can, it's more or less, you just gotta get the temperature up to 165 because of, um, what, is, what, are, what are you going for? For safety, I mean. For you know, safety reasons. Yeah, 165. 165 is where chicken needs to be. So once it gets there, usually chicken's kind of like half falling apart when it's on the grill or 
yeah, I recommend just doing really whatever you want with it. Yeah, and I think, so we're, when we do the pork chop, I'm going to talk a little bit about brining, but I'll just talk about it now because I think uh, chicken breasts lend themselves well to brining because typically a chicken breast could dry out pretty easily at the drier part of the chicken um, as far as cooking. So brine. So we brine our pork chop here because that is also a piece of meat that's subject to drying out really easily. Um, so what a brine does, it's a, it's a combination of salt and water, basically. You can add sugar, you can add any other sp ooh, spices you want to. Um, but what it does is it starts to break down the muscle of whatever it is that you're brining, so that when you do cook it, it's going to retain its juices much better. It's going to just lend to a juicier product if you brine it beforehand. So with a chicken breast, I might try or recommend trying a brine for it. And I do have a really basic recipe for a brine on the information that Mike's going to send out to you guys. But if you just do a quick Google search too, you'll usually find some good brine recipes. So, yeah. Anything else, Mike? Google's good for a lot of questions. It is. No other questions at this point. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see here. I think, yeah, so I think we're going to get this pork chop on the grill. Um, so yeah, like I said, we did a really simple brine on this chop. Um, it's just brown sugar, salt, water, and a little bit of tamari, which is a gluten-free soy sauce, um, which adds some salt. Um, so I typically, one of my favorite brines is just purely soy sauce, brown sugar, and some rice wine vinegar. I love that for a pork chop and the brown sugar helps so beautifully to caramelize the meat um, when you're cooking it. More caramelization than you would usually get. It's got that sugar on the outside of it, so. Did you want to add any seasoning to this? Or did you just yeah, want to let's, grill? let's lightly season, yep. So we're gonna lightly season because there is salt in the brine. That's something you do have to watch out for when you are brining things, is you're gonna wanna tone down your seasoning a little bit because you have salt in that brine and that meat's gonna absorb some of that salt. So we got a really beautiful pork chop. This is from Blackbrook Farm in Amory here, our town. Um, so yeah, we love them. They do tons of veggies, um, lots of, they do pork. I think they have cows as well right now. Um, so yeah, they, they, they kind of uh, supply us with the bulk of our veggies actually. So. There's your six minute timer. Right, that's my timer and my fish. So I'm gonna pull it off and just temp it. I think it's nice to temp fish. I mean, you can tell with fish because it's like very opaque in color when it's done, um, but temping's nice, and I'm looking for 135, and I'm temping fish. I think we turned down our grill a little bit too much because... Yeah, we turned our grill down a little bit because we worried about the, the fish going on there. It's too hot. I can tell by the look of it, it's a little not underdone. It's got that raw look on top a little bit. I don't know how well you can see there, but I can tell the underside is getting opaque, so it's getting there. Um, so I'm not even going to bother temping it right now, and I am going to put it back on for a couple more minutes. And I'm going to try to rewrap my foil as nice as I can. That's pretty nice. So we'll just do a quick view of the grill. Jake flipped that walleye. You know, it's, uh, it's, it freed up itself. I uh, had to pry it just a touch, but it freed up itself, and we got some nice grill marks on it. It looks it's looking good. That's the importance of waiting, because if he had pulled it earlier, a lot of that flesh would be stuck to our grates right now. So we waited, got some nice marks. Feels really juicy and tender, so that's exciting. Absolutely. Patience is the key to cooking. <laughs> yeah. Be patient with what you have. And and the chops we're putting on super heat again were kind of similar to meat or to the beef. We're looking for a very hot spot on the grill for those chops. Um, yeah, and he is also doing a little bit of that tallow on there. We don't want to flame up again, but we'll do a little bit. So. And again, chops don't necessarily need any lube. As you can see, they have tons of beautiful fat on them. Um, but again, that, that lube just kind of helps with the caramelization process. Um, that we like. What do you think? That fish darn close. Ooh. Should we temp it? Sure. All right, let's temp this grilled fish. We'll go to the 
media spot. The media spot. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're definitely there. A little over. So I think we that's can. That's not too bad. 140, yeah. that's about yeah. perfect. So we'll pull that, guys. What do you want to do? Put it next to the steak? Sure. Surf and surf? Yep, surf and surf. It hasn't been on this side for too long, so it's not freeing up the greatest, but. And I think it would be important to, to do this method with skin on, because even though some of the skin stuck a little bit to the grates, he was still able to not lose much meat at all, because he had that skin there that's kind of like a buffer. All right, I'm gonna pull this guy back. And I'm going to look at my baked fish. One thing that I wanted to say about um, cooking steaks in general and cooking pretty much anything is there's a lot of talk about taking your steak, taking your meat out of the fridge uh, an hour before you start cooking it or say two hours just to kind of like bring that temperature up to more of the level of the grill. But I have definitely found that that is... I don't, you got to be very, very tuned in if you want to do that. Um, I like to just keep my steak, keep, keep whatever you're cooking in the fridge until it's exactly ready to go on the grill. And there's very little that you're going to gain when you're warming it up to say a room temperature. Cause then you just got say bacteria growth on it. Um, and then, yeah, it is going to get killed on the grill, but yeah, any, everything I've learned in the past, eight years of doing this that definitely keep it cold until <laughs> where are we not? Yeah, I just got it. sorry guys. <laughs> keep it keep it chilled until it's exactly ready to be on the grill. Yeah. And it wouldn't I mean it's hard for us in the restaurant to do this, but I mean it wouldn't hurt at all to like season your meat like an hour before you were ready to put it on the grill. You don't want to season it too far in advance. But like an hour before would be nice. It would give that meat a little bit more chance to absorb that salt. Um, but yeah, I want to show you guys this fish. It's all done, temped out really nice. It smells so good. The herbs that are in there just like um, are so aromatic right now. The tarragon smells so good. Super juicy. Um, so yeah, it's just ready to eat. I would just eat this whole with, with veggies. So yeah, this is all done. It, it ended up taking me about 10 minutes, I'd say overall this method. Um, so yeah, I'm going to set this in our proteins. I'm going to show you guys right now all the beautiful stuff we've got. Here, let's see here. How can no, I... you're just pointing at me. Ah, this is hard. Okay, sorry. All the... <laughs> is this good? Can you see Mike? Yes, we can. Yeah. No, Super beautiful grill marks on everything. So. Sorry, took you guys for a ride. I hope you're not motion sick. All right, how's our chops looking? Bring Last us. two times in Cancun, my dad got, got seasickness when we were out fishing. Oh boy. Maybe partying a little too hard <laughs> <laughs> the night before. Do you want to talk about the blood again? So it just started bleeding and medium, like a medium steak is 145 degrees. So I kind of relate that to keeping, keeping it on well, the same side until um, you have bigger pools of blood because if you have a medium steak, you need bigger pools of blood and that temps out at 145. And you can always check the tent. I mean, it's still cold on the top side, which yeah. isn't that big of a deal, but. Yeah. But yeah, at the bone area on the shop, we're starting to see a lot of red blood coming from the bone. And then on the very top, there's some really nice juice pooling. And then you can also see on the side here, the fat is starting to, Whoops, sorry. That's okay. The fat is starting to melt, which is an, also a good indicator that you're getting near the point where you need to flip it. Especially right here where it's flaming up. Yeah, <laughs> right. And this one, this one is just kind of a lost cause. Yeah, maybe we'll focus on that one. Any other questions, Mike, at this point? 
Well, can you remind us about the brine that you made for the pork chops and how long you had that in the brine? Sure. We brined this one overnight only. Um, and I guess I'd say like sometimes when I'm doing my brine with soy sauce and with um, brown sugar and stuff, you can leave it in longer. And I just think it's because it's not like just pure salt. The soy sauce is salty itself. Um, but it's not just pure salt that's getting absorbed into the to the meat. So this one does just directly have salt in it. So we did that overnight. But one with a lighter salt, like in a soy sauce day, you could probably do for longer. And I have done it for a few days and it's been great. So let's put this one. Woo! That looks good. Super, super sexy grill lines on there. Um, you're trying to impress pork chops, a really good one to do. So, pork yeah. char on this side from the flame. Yeah. We're kind of freestyling it with this grill. <laughs> we are. Should we play with plating a little bit of our stuff later while we're waiting for that? Sure. Okay. All right, so now we're just gonna have a little fun plating and maybe cut our steak open while we're waiting for that um, pork chop to finish up. We got about Six, five minutes on these pork chops. Okay, yeah, so about five minutes on the chop. And we also have a question, uh, Sarah and Jake, about uh, other recommendations for doing veggies on the grill. Other varieties of veggies to do? Well, either varieties of veggies, but other preparation too, I think. Sure. Or well, I mean, you're a little limited grilling as far as you can actually cook them, but I mean, you could season the, the veggies that I did. You could season them with anything and everything. Um, let's see. I another good thing you could do on the grill would be like potatoes and foil. And like again, I mean, I go to this compound butter all the time for flavor, but it's like you could do some little new potatoes, which will be coming up soon. Those really little tender guys, and do some of this ramp butter, salt and pepper, maybe even a little cheese, like a little romano or parmesan or something salty like that. Wrap it all up and put that on the grill and that would be really beautiful um, to eat as well. Um, I think you can do just about anything. Yeah. Um, just got to be patient with it and just let, say you're doing sliced beets for example. Yeah. Just act like the fish and wait till the grill lets go of it before you flip it. Yeah. And that's all you really need. That is crucial, yeah, even with veg or meat, like you just want to wait till the grill is ready to let you have it basically, because um, then you're going to end up with the nice lines, and you're not going to lose your flesh stuff on them. But don't wait too long, it's a little bit overdone, so it's, um, it's kind of a, it's an art. It is, yeah, you really, it, like grilling uses like all of your senses, you're, you're visualizing it, you're smelling, you're touching your stuff, hopefully your meat especially, and you get a really good feel. Um, for the temperature that's at. Um, we're at the end of asparagus season. We have a little bit more in our fridge right now, but it's pretty much over. Asparagus is a really beautiful one to throw on the grill. Just olive oil, salt, pepper, toss it on there, and it's amazing with a little charcoal or with a little, you know, dark taste on it. Um, I also, what else do I love to do? Oh, garlic scapes. Those are um, in season right now. Those are the green part the above ground part of the garlic plant. Those have a really beautiful mild garlic taste. Um, those are something you could toss in olive oil, throw on the grill, salt and pepper, cut it up finely and eat it as an accompaniment to any of your proteins or with your other veg. That would be a beautiful thing to do as well. Um, yeah, tons of things. And just play, you know, play with it. I think some veggies lend themselves better to grilling than others do, but you can try pretty much any, any veggie. Pulled off this chop, which looks really gorgeous. Yep, it jumped out at 148 degrees. And that yeah, so that's gives perfect. Gives us the green light of taking it off. Yeah, and chops are nice to let rest also, just like beef. Um, so yeah, and for this pork chop, I made a little bit, or I made a fruit sauce. I think fruit accompanies pork really nicely. Um, so I just made a thyme and ter or sorry, a thyme and blueberry sauce. Um, literally, it was just blueberry sugar, and then I took a, um, I made a bouquet of fresh thyme, 
from the garden, put it in there, and the aromatics really imparted flavor into the blueberry sauce. So, kind of like the herb brush. Yeah, kind of like an herb brush, but just in the... In the blueberries. Yeah, so I'm just going to put that right on the top while it, while it rests. Um, and I think the chop lends itself, of course, to like an apple sauce, you know, or I've done a strawberry and rosemary sauce for the pork chop. That was really beautiful. Um, lots of different things. A fruit sauce, huh? Yeah, fruit sauce. Fruit really goes well with, with pork, the richness and fattiness of pork. Um, yeah. About a minute away at the last one. Nice. One thirty-eight. Cut this steak. Sure. Do a plate. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. It's getting smoky in here. It is getting smoky I in here. I hope our fire alarm doesn't go off. Maybe the door crack open so you guys can <laughs> hear us. <laughs> grilled veg and your steak cut up on top. This is our mid-rare. We can see so well, but really nice and pink and juicy in the inside and we let it rest so it's just perfect and ready to eat. Why do you guys let the uh, the steak and I guess the pork as well rest? What was that? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. Why do you let the pork and steak rest? It like retains its juices. So if you cut the thing right away, it's gonna bleed out all of those juices that you worked really hard to keep in the inside. So if you let it rest, it's gonna just retain those juices better, and you're gonna lose less to the plate blood out of it. It's going to be nice and inside and those, of it. those juices hold a lot of flavor too. Oh yeah. Tons of flavor. I don't know if, Jack, or if Jake said this, but fat is flavor. That's what he kept saying before. And it's true. I mean, the fat is just absolutely delicious. Especially if you're getting really good quality grass-fed beef. The fat is just, just as much of a delicacy as the actual meat itself. So, like I see everybody Cutting around their fat, feeding their fat to right. the dog. The dogs get the best meal out of anyone. Yeah, the fat is fantastic. Same on the pork chop. He's just cutting it off the bone there. I'll do another veg set, maybe. Okay. You guys are going to have to come join us. We're going to have a buffet to ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, Mike, that we can answer? 
Uh, not at the moment. Okay. But yeah. I do love grilling because you can socialize and hang out with, you know, the party guests that you have, or if you're just grilling for your family or whatever. Have your watermelon daiquiri, and it's a little more of a low-key kind of cooking method. Um, and when you're doing just whole ingredients like this, I mean, we just slapped whole squash, whole turnip, and then a nice piece of protein on there, and it's a really great meal. Don't even have to fire up your, your oven. Right. This is really key when it's so hot out, like today. So yeah, I mean, the, the pork chop, you know, you're not going to really see any pink. You're looking for an opaque color, pretty much, because pork chop's not necessarily something you want to eat mid-rare, unless you know you're getting it from a really good source. Um, so, just have that nice blueberry sauce over the veg. Well, as good as your source is, it's still the whole, the whole point of pork and you know, cinnamon. Right, right. Um, one of the other things that I love is uh, edible flowers. So this is calendula that I'm just gonna sprinkle on my pork chop dish. And that just like adds really, it's just a beautiful touch to add to your, to your meal. So I got that calendula flower sprinkled on there. Um, and calendula, it doesn't have too much of a flavor really. It's like a little bit spicy if anything, I'd say. Um, another trick that I love when plating is nasturtium flower, or this is nasturtium leaf. We don't have any flowers yet on our um, plants, but it looks like a lily pad. It's super beautiful and edible. So I love just like setting those really nicely, kind of on top of your protein or your dish. It's just a really beautiful edible garnish. Um, so we love using edible garnishes at farm table. Especially when you can go pick it. Right, when you can right outside. We just picked it right before. And we do have a question about related to that to seasoning. You know, once you've plated it, yeah. uh, is, are other seasonings recommended or needed? I think, like in the restaurant, or you know, when we're serving a steak uh, during service, all we do really at the end is do a nice, like, flaky salt, really lightly, and mostly that's just for kind of a nice, pleasant salt on top of the. The dish, it like it just gets salt right when you first bite in. It's not seasoning all the meat because you just sprinkled it on there, but it's just like a nice, pleasant um, crunch and a little bit extra flavor when you first bite into the meat. So if you did a good job seasoning your meat when you put it on the grill, you really should be good. Um, but if you do pull it off and you do taste it, and you're like, ah, this is a little bland. This could use a little more. Then yeah, I would just throw on some more salt and pepper for sure. And that flake salt, when it melts, it like forms a layer yeah. of just like, crystallized. You know, yeah. like a crystallized layer of salt. Yeah, because it does like, your flake salt melts a little bit when it hits the juices and the, the heat on whatever protein you're putting it on. But yeah, again, if you do a really good job seasoning it beforehand, I wouldn't worry about too much seasoning it after. And the sauces that we're adding really help with that too, you know, we added the blueberry sauce and that chop and we added the herby chimichurri sauce to the top of the steak. So those are another thing Yet another thing that's enhancing, enhancing the flavor of your, your protein that you're feeding. Yeah. And the handout that I send out will also have uh, the chimichurri sauce on it. Yes. Yep. And it recommends, yeah, cilantro and um, oregano, but you can do most, most any fresh herb you have in your garden, you could make a chimichurri sauce. With. I think we should go sit at a table so we can turn the fans on and maybe yeah. uh, have, have a little snack. Well, yeah, so that's, that's what we got, Mike. Um, so is there any other questions that you have or that we can answer for anybody else? Or, or we could go sit down with the back. Well, <laughs> there, there is a, this is nice. Someone said that you're doing such a great job, an awesome job. So they're thanking you. Thank and you. Then they're also asking us as an organization in a way, when can we do in-person classes again? Uh, of course, we'd love to be tasting these things together, of course. Um, and that's something for those of you on the, on the call, on the class, we're certainly talking about that. We are, I don't know if I would say airing, but we're certainly concerned about safety as we hear about numbers of, of infections going up around the country anyway. And, right. 
one of the one of the concerns is uh, particularly cooking together would be an added risk. Um, so we may try. We are going to try an in-person around the garden class outside. Uh, we've for those of you on the call, we've got this really exciting program this summer, the Victory Garden program, where 175 people bought trays of vegetables, and then we've been doing weekly video garden tutorials. Um, and we're going to gather together uh, around the around the garden uh, in about two or three weeks, and then have an opportunity to be socially distant but still still together outside. We we're a little hesitant to bring people inside yet, so that's a bit where we're at right now. Of course, our restaurant is open and practicing, you know, safe safe practices and, and uh, mainly serving outside with some so socially distant tables inside. So, but yeah, do, do folks have any other questions as Sarah and Jake sort of transition to the table here? Um, if you have other questions for them about grilling in general or any other maybe cooking tips from chefs there in the restaurant, feel free to type those in. I guess I just highlight too, like when you're choosing the veg that you're working with, you know, at farm table anyways, we super pay attention to what's in season, you know, I mean, we, you know, we haven't tasted tomatoes since last tomato season uh, that are fresh anyways. Um, so, you know, zucchini, we just got last week, the first batch, and that was really exciting. So immediately we're putting it on plates and featuring a lot of herbs right now, because um, those are just thriving in the garden. So, I mean, I think, yeah, it's easy to base cuisine off of what is in season, especially in grilling. And thank you for your kind comments, folks. Um, I've also put in, in the chat box our, our phone number at the restaurant. You, we are taking reservations there. If you have uh, something you want to order, we're doing a lot of ordering now, too, and provisions. So in these days, you know, when some things can be on short supply at the grocery store, we're able to provide some really great, um, and, you know, in a way, access to really local foods. So whether it's yeast or flour or butter or milk or some of the produce that you've seen here today, you can get more and more of that at farm table itself as one of the services we're offering. Um, a lot of folks are saying thank you for, for the class, Jake and Sarah. And they also say, could you please taste your beautiful work, even though we will be jealous and uh, kind of- Absolutely. That's true. Gotta watch us eat food, <laughs> we surely will. Oh yeah, very nice. Mm. Good taste. Amazing. Oh my God, you can taste how tender it is because of the brine. It's okay, so that's enough, that's enough, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, you can't eat it either. Oh my God, and I'm eating a very fatty piece and it is delicious. Nice. There's so much flavor to the steak. It's like. <laughs> What's it like? Oh my God. It's like one would be enough. Oh yeah. One steak. Very nice. Um, by the way, someone has sent out a little shout out to Paul Oman. So you can see the artwork in the background. Um, Paul, Paul Oman, a local artist, has his work there now. And though we're not able to have a, an opening, you're, you can feel free if you're at the restaurant or something to, to browse through and see Paul's work as well. Um, yep. any, other, any other questions for Jake or Sarah about the class or? So I think our next class is gonna be uh, possibly around the campfire grilling over a fire. Yeah, I guess that would be a good question just briefly to both of you. Um, you know, perhaps a lot of folks on the line might be grilling outside over a charcoal or some, or, or propane, I suppose. But it sounds like it would be quite similar in sort of the, the tips and techniques that you've gone over today, same as if you're cooking outside over a grill. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's just the heat source is what you're cooking from. So, I mean, charcoal, propane, natural gas, it's all gonna be pretty much the same. The charcoal is gonna give a little bit different flavor, um, just like the, the, the gas grill, propane grill. It's a little harder to maintain 
you know, the heat that you want when cooking over a fire. Like it's, I'd say it's like just more challenging than grilling because you don't have knobs you're turning. You can't see temperatures. It's, you're working with coals and logs. And so it's just hard to, make, to maintain the temperatures that you want. Just more advanced because you're watching the product you're cooking as well as you're trying to maintain your, your fire that you want, so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, just a note too about uh, Sarah and the restaurant have put together some some grill packs for the 4th of July and some steak packs. So if you want to try out some of the produce and, and proteins that actually Jake and Sarah have been using today, you can get some similar product from the restaurant in these grill packs and take them home and, and try your try your new your new tips out this weekend if you like. We'll probably be here too, so you can probably ask us in person. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That is right. Yep. Be on the line. Yep. Oh, that fish is. It's amazing. Super good. Wow. Well, when we do have in class person in class uh, in person classes together again, everybody will be able to join Jake and Sarah in the tasting part here. So. Jake and Sarah, anything else you'd like to, to mention before we wrap up here? Have fun with your grill and be patient with it. Yeah. Uh, get to know it. and Yeah, you can do some, some great things with it. Even just going to your garden right beforehand, picking it. Yep. Just like we did today. Yeah. Well, practically. Yeah, and I guess too with grilling, I feel like more than ever, you don't feel like you need to follow a recipe. I think grilling's a lot about instincts and just having fun with it you know like i i made this sauce like 20 minutes before class started and it turned out pretty dang good but it also could have turned out not so great or okay but i just tried it and it turned out good so you know just like be creative and fun and enjoy the seasonal food and as far as seasonal food goes yeah we've got a couple of classes coming up um in july and august one's on summer ferments so once those once the produce is coming in out of your gardens or off the farmer's markets or from your CSA box, you can actually start fermenting some of that stuff. So it's called Summer Ferments and Creative Kimchi. That's one we're having in July. And in, in August, we've got a gazpacho soup class with Terry Kelzer. So um, some good classes coming up again, trying to emphasize the what's coming in out of the gardens. So keep abreast of what we're up to on our website and Call the restaurant if you need to place an order or get a reservation. And we're just grateful for all of you participating and, and uh, for your support of this organization. And thank, thank you, you, thank you to Jake and Sarah. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah, we closed our first class. Now it'll be easier from here. <laughs> you got it. it was it wasn't too hard to get them in, but uh, it's good to have you as teachers now, both of you, and we appreciate it. And yeah. folks, I'll be sending out that handout along with a. Uh, a video, a recording of the of the class if you want to review any of it. So I also just want to say hi, Jake's mom. <laughs> Very good. Good to have family uh, supporting us always. <laughs> yep. All right. Yep. Good night, all. Thank you so much. Adios.